So uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak today uh, to the moderators and to Sages. And I am proudly here to talk to you about failure. Um, I have no disclosures that are relevant to this talk. So there was an attending back when I was a resident who had this wonderful saying, uh, if you walk in the rain, you're going to get wet. Uh, and I think if you do a lot of reflux surgery, anti-reflux surgery, um, ultimately at some point you're going to be dealing with failure, uh, either those of others uh, and or your own. Um, we know that fund application is, is really good for a lot of people. Uh, this is data that's about a decade old now. And you can see uh, you know, patients have great symptom resolution, people improve. Um, but um, there's a myriad of studies that uh, tell us about recurrences. Uh, and depending on what you read, uh, and a lot in part of uh, how big the hiatal hernia or parasophageal hernia that was being repaired, um, recurrences can be anywhere from 3 to 40 percent. So when I'm thinking about re reoperative surgery, uh, I, I'm kind of a pessimist, and I think about this picture. Um, we live in Utah, and there's a lot of paleontology, and here's a tar pit. And there's this big woolly mammoth and these uh, saber-toothed cats, like this, this one down low went in to get the thing and he couldn't get it and he got, he got trapped. And then the next one goes in and gets trapped in the tar. And then this third thing here thinks it can do a better job than the other two guys. Uh, and it's about to get trapped as well. Um, so it's really important in reoperative surgery not to get trapped. Uh, you know, it's not that we can be better than the last guy. It's more, you know, why wasn't the last guy successful? Um, and in you know, kind of thinking about these problems, I tend to sort of break things down really into to kind of two groups. One is patient factors. So is there something about the patient um, that led to failure of the operation, maybe obesity or um, severe gastroparesis that wasn't recognized and the person had nausea and vomiting, constipation that was severe, they were straining, um, compliance factors. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, perioperative recurrence because that's a real entity and I think it, it bears uh, a slide. Um, and then really some technical factors. So how is the operation done? You know, what was the, the workup leading up to it? Uh, and I'll, I'll touch on those in more length here. Um, so to, to briefly discuss perioperative recurrence, this is something I was kind of tell the residents about because it's not really something I learned about in my residency and it's real. Um, you know, even in experienced centers like uh, this from Dr. Hunter, I, I think when he was back east, uh, in their series of 54 reoperative patients, five of their reoperations were for acute perioperative recurrence. Uh, and the typical story for this is somebody is, you know, doing well or, you know, in the hospital, just got home and they have an episode of retching, uh, and then they come with severe epigastric pain and dysphagia. And it's important to be aware of this entity uh, and evaluate for it radiographically. Uh, if you identify it, that patient, if they're with Within a few days of surgery, should go back to the operating room and have that reduced to avoid respiratory complications and ischemia and to rule out perforation. More commonly, though, uh, when we think about technical failure, um, we're thinking about long term recurrences. And so this is a schematic that kind of uh, typifies this. Um, there are different types of failure, uh, and we think the etiologies of these are somewhat different. Uh, so type 1 failure is re-herniation of the gastroesophageal junction with or without the associated fund application above the level of the diaphragm. Um, and we're taught that this can be due to inadequate mediastinal dissection. Uh, maybe failure to recognize or deal with a shortened esophagus, inadequate closure of the hiatus, uh, or um, maybe a little bit more controversially, inadequate fixation of the repair. Um, type 2 recurrences are actually the most common in most uh, adult uh, patient series, and this is the parasophageal hernia. Uh, this can be due to creating an overly redundant fund application, leaving too much posterior fundus behind that can re-herniate, uh, or a defective hiatal closure. Um, type 3, I don't really have a great picture of that for you, but that's essentially a misconstructedness in fund application where you carry uh, the, the fund application too far down on the greater curve, uh, wrapping the body of the stomach inadvertently. Um, one can also create a wrap that's too tight, too loose. Uh, there's a phenomenon of wrap breakdown, you know, the toupee taco that becomes an open face taco. Uh, failure of recognition of underlying esophageal or gastric motility disorders. So. Um, my manometry colleagues, uh, speaking of wrapping achalasia uh, with a total fund application, uh, or missing someone who has severe diabetic gastroparesis. Um, so how do you avoid failure this time around uh, is the question one asks oneself. 
Um, and I think, you know, really, really being attentive to the history uh, and the preoperative workup is essential. So it's important to really listen to your patient. You know, what were the symptoms you had your original surgery before? Uh, how did you feel after surgery? And when did you start to feel poorly again? Um, obtain old operative notes. And I think sometimes it's very useful to obtain uh, 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 all of the diagnostic testing that was done to evaluate your patients. So I have seen manometry that was also misinterpreted uh, uh, and, and such things. Um, and then repeat the workup. So do another endoscopy, rule out malignancy and ulceration, uh, get a manometry, see what their esophageal motility is like. Uh, pH study, I think we use a little bit more judiciously, uh, so I won't necessarily get this in someone with a big recurrent parasophageal hernia who comes in with uh, dysphagia and regurg, but I may get it in someone who just has recurrent heartburn. Um, gastric emptying study as well, if you suspect parasis. I, I tend to get this in everyone I reoperate on, uh, although uh, you know experts would, would not uh, mandate that. Um, old operative notes, uh, it's important to get these, uh, but if you live in uh, a place like Utah that doesn't have a lot of electronic medical records, uh, um, have a low threshold to obtain cross-sectional imaging and look for old staple lines from a prior gastroplasty or old mesh, because that's going to make your operative dissection a lot more challenging. Um, I think it's also important both for us as surgeons um, and for our patients in terms of anticipatory guidance to know that a reoperation is not the same thing as the hour-long, you know, overnight stay fund application that they may have had for their primary surgery. So again, this is data from very, very experienced uh, reflux surgeons. And as you can see, the intraoperative perforation rate is real. The postoperative leak rate is real. And you need to discuss these things uh, when you're consenting a patient for surgery. When should you redo? Um, so you know, given the complexity and the risks, it's important to do things like maximizing medical management. Have your patient lose some weight, you know, lifestyle changes if they're able to undertake those. Maximize PPI therapy unless there's a contraindication to that. Uh, don't operate on anybody sent to you for a redo who has an incidental anatomic recurrence, so the asymptomatic patient that gets the APCT uh, and their hernia is back. Talk to that patient. Um, don't do that surgery. Uh, use caution in people who have atypical symptoms and uh, come to you with only sort of mildly abnormal pH studies. They may not be very happy with their second operative result. Um, some surgical principles, and I think others will kind of go into this in a, a bit more detail, so I'll just kind of touch on some things. You know, the things that we learned as, as residents and fellows and that we teach um, are the same principles, uh, you know, for reoperative surgeries. So they're just a little bit more challenging, right? Um, you want to uh, adequately mobilize uh, your GE junction, but sometimes due to scar tissue, it's, it's hard to tell where that really is. Uh, it's a very nice uh, luxury, I think, to have uh, intraoperative endoscopy at your disposal. Um, you know, certainly request that if that's not available to you, and you know, really verify that your Z-line is down. Um, minimize tension during hiatal ray approximation, total hernia sac uh, excision. Um, we just heard that this is a, a bit controversial, but in reoperative surgery, when I have someone with significant dysphagia, I like to tailor my fund application uh, with that in mind. Um, gastropexy, uh, pyloroplasty, or some people advocate for gastrostomy tube. If you have someone who is severely gastroparetic, you don't want to put a total fund application at the top of that and have that patient vomiting. Uh, and then preparation to open, and uh, you know, in complicated cases, this can involve a thoracoabdominal approach, um, particularly people who had emergency surgery, leak, prior colis, that can be challenging. And, and if you're not well versed in that or familiar, operate with a senior colleague who is or refer that patient out. Um, the short esophagus also bears some mention, so I, I think everyone you know, kind of agrees uh, based on the literature that the acceptable cutoff is somewhere around three to four centimeters of intra-abdominal esophagus, and that anything less than that after your extensive mediastinal dissection can increase your risk of transhiatal reherniation and slippage. Um, there's a nice study uh, that uh, Dr. Erbach and, and colleagues did, I think maybe when he was a, a fellow in Portland, um, where they looked at all these patients who had had uh, surgery and kind of pulled out the, the group that had had colis gastroplasty um, and looked at predictors of that. And notably, one of those predictors is, is reoperation. Uh, so you may be dealing with a short esophagus and a GE junction that you can't mobilize adequately. Um, it's important to be versed in some lengthening techniques. So unilateral uh, vagotomy 
Um, you know, my, my colleague's uh, institution here published uh, on that. Collis gastroplasty is another technique. Um, familiarize uh, yourself uh, with those. Um, something that is, uh, you know, a, a part of my practice, so I do a lot of bariatric surgery, uh, and I have patients referred in uh, for failed fund application um, or consideration of, of uh, gastric bypass for reflux. And my reoperative patients tend to be people who are morbidly obese and they had a failed fund application, or people who may not be morbidly obese, but they've had multiple prior uh, surgeries for reflux. Um, it's important to kind of think about these patients uh, with some bariatric mentality. So these people have to be compliant. You can't operate on people who are smoking or you're going to wind up with ulcers. Um, people have to be able to afford uh, and have access to lifelong nutritional supplementation and have follow-up of their nutrition. Um, and every now and then I'll have a patient referred in uh, who's sent by a reflux surgeon who does not do bariatrics for, you know, fixing reflux. Um, some of these people don't care about their weight, and they don't necessarily want a weight loss operation. And in these people, I'm very careful to do an evaluation that is a reflux evaluation. Um, so certainly, you know, in reoperative surgery, I think we're routinely doing endoscopies. There's been a lot of talk about that you know, for bariatrics at this meeting. Uh, but for these people, if, if someone doesn't care about their weight loss and it's just their heartburn, you know, I may be doing a pH study as well. Um, so some things to think about. I think the other thing to just sort of note and to tell your patients is that gastric bypass is not a panacea uh, for preventing recurrence. So here's a nice man that was referred to me. Uh, he had a hiatal dissection, repair of that hiatal hernia to ruin my gastric bypass and did wonderfully, lost a lot of weight. Uh, and then two years out, had new onset of reflux and dysphagia and there's this pouch in his chest with a you know, gastrojejunostomy kinked at the, the diaphragm. Uh, and so he had a, a revision. Uh, with repair of his hiatal hernia. It's also important to know maybe, you know, when, when we've reached our limits. Uh, so uh, this is a, a gentleman that I, uh, you know, saw in clinic uh, who came in uh, with a history of three prior fund applications. No operative records were available. Um, severe reflux and dysphagia. Uh, and this is his endoscopy, uh, which is uh, pretty hemorrhagic. And when we get to his GE junction there, he's got this ulcerated area. So on his cross-sectional imaging, here's some prosthetic mesh, uh, which has been circumferentially uh, placed about his, GI, or his GE junction. And so we referred him to thoracic surgery uh, to, to discuss uh, esophagectomy for that. So in summary, I think uh, my pearls would be maximize medical management when appropriate. Uh, do a very thorough preoperative evaluation. You know, listen to the patient, get a good history, repeat your testing. Um, do a risk appraisal both, you know, with your patient, talking to them about the risks of reoperation, and also of yourself and your own resources and abilities and what you feel comfortable with and, and what you might refer out. Um, you know, verse yourself in some of these techniques here uh, and refer when appropriate. So this is a book I'm reading to my five-year-old, uh, and I, I, I feel like this sometimes when I'm teaching. So here's the, you know, the dad that's teaching his kid to ride the bike. He rides through the puddle, and he says, hey, I, I just taught you a great lesson. Um, so we should learn from our own mistakes uh, and learn from the mistakes of others uh, and uh, help some people. Thanks very much for the opportunity.